Thank you, Dorothy, for that wonderful introduction, and uh, welcome, welcome all of you to the beautiful Menifee Lakes Country Club. We're so happy to uh, have you here and to host this event. We're all very, very excited that you're here to hear about what's going on in our great city. Um, I want to thank uh, our, the Chamber of Commerce and the city for co-hosting and as well as the Waste Management Group for uh, being our event sponsor today. You may have noticed that we're going to change it up, we're going to mix it up a little bit and do things a little bit differently this time than we have in the past and uh, the format's going to be slightly different. Um, as I was thinking about this event, I was reminded that the city is only six years new. And I was also uh, reminded that the city incorporated right smack dab in the middle of the Great Recession. And that presented some challenges for us, but more importantly, it presented opportunities, and opportunities that are unique to us that we've seized. You know, the Disney Corporation, the Microsoft Corporation, those great brand names all were created during a recession, during recessionary times, and they rapidly became well-known, long-standing international brands. No one can argue with their success. And I would suggest that no one can argue with the successes of the city of Menifee in its short lifetime. We're building our brand. We're building our legacy. And we're creating a long-lasting uh, community for generations to come. And what I like to share is I, I think that there are key components to a su every successful community. You need quality health care systems. You need quality public education with state-of-the-art facilities. You need safe schools, safe neighborhoods, and safe businesses. And you need a municipal government that's innovative, nimble, and flexible enough to meet the rising demands of a growing city. And our panel of guest speakers today embodies that concept. And without any further ado, we're going to bring them up here, and I'm going to stop talking for the rest of the time until we wrap it up. Our first speaker today holds a bachelor's degree in workforce development and a master's degree in education. He has over 25 years of law enforcement experience and, and began his career in 1988 with the Hemet Police Department. His assignments included patrol traffic, excuse me, patrol, traffic, investigations, and SWAT. And uh, around 1996, he decided to change the color of his uniform left him at PD and joined the Riverside Sheriff's Department, where he was assigned to the criminal apprehension team at the, para, at the Hemet Station, so he went right back there. As he progressed in rank, he served in various other assignments, including the Harupa Valley Station as a patrol sergeant, the Norco Station as the assistant chief of police, the Southwest Detention Center, where he managed uh, transportation operations, classification, and the business office as a new lieutenant, and he was the administrative lieutenant there, the Southwest Station, serving the city of Temecula and the unincorporated areas surrounding it. The Ben Clark Training Center as an administrative lieutenant. And promoting to captain in 2012, his first command was the Coordinated Custody Management Unit, Riverside Alternative Sentencing Programs, and the Sheriff's Inmate Training and Education Bureau. He has held command of the Paris Station since 2013. Please join me in welcoming the, the Chief of Police for the City of Menifee, Captain Mike Judge. I was asked to come speak today. At first, I, I thought it was going to be the uh, uh, state of the city. And then I was told it's an ec uh, economic forecast. And I thought, well, OK, they must be talking about my six kids, and they want to know how dismal mine is. <laughs> anyway, today I plan on touching on the contract staffing, part one crimes, uh, calls for service, response times, and some challenges and opportunities, just as the mayor has spoken about. Can everybody hear me? Dorothy says they can't hear me. Chuck, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> everybody else can hear me, though, right? Okay. Anyway, the police contract right now uh, sits at 11.1 million. Uh, we do anticipate a 5% increase uh, to the contract itself. And what that gives you is basically 120 hours per day patrol, contract hours, plus some special teams. And I'd like to touch on those because uh, those are the ones that you probably uh, see the most within our city. Uh, we have four set officers, two traffic officers, a task force officer, two motor officers, and two officers assigned to Quail Valley. 
And I'd like to just mention, October of 2014, we added that motor. Uh, hopefully not too many in the room know him real well. Uh, however, uh, we also added two new patrol deputies to our force. So as you can see, uh, the council, the leaders of the community, very committed to public safety, um, and we're starting to bring on some people, um, which I'll go into some context later, that you'll start to see a decrease in response times and things of that nature. Now I'm going to talk about some baseline services that come with the contract. Uh, things that already are present within the county and therefore uh, do not get charged to the city of Menifee. Those things include aviation, the county canine program, forensic services, special enforcement bureau or SWAT team, hostage negotiation team, special investigations bureau, and the hazardous device team, our bomb squad. You also get the dive team, but most important, uh, you have indemnification. The River, county of Riverside is self-insured, so any liability that stems from police services, um, the city is held free and clear. It'll all come back onto the county. Other things that we have available, um, I, I think everybody here realizes that our station is actually situated in Paris. Um, Within that, we are responsible for about 270 square miles and about 290,000 people, and we have forensics for the entire county assigned to us. So with that, we have a very large force. Uh, we have the Central Homicide Unit, Dispatch, Gang Task Force, Personnel, South, uh, Southwest Corridor Narcotics Task Force, and the Traffic Services Reconstruction. Now I want to touch on part one crimes. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to give you the number. I know everybody wants the number to see uh, what the update is from last year. However, I have not been able to uh, contact the mayor, the council, and the city manager to inform them. I actually just got these numbers at about 8 o'clock last night. I will tell you, it is expected that there will be a decrease uh, from last year, so that is a good sign. With that said, I'd like everybody to remember, part one crimes dropped pretty drastically last year. That is probably an anomaly. I, I got a big smile on my face just learning that the preliminary numbers for 2014 are going to come in with a decrease. Um, but I'll tell you, I wasn't expecting it. And especially with a city that is growing so quickly uh, as the city of Menifee is growing not just commercial, not just resident, the population itself is booming. And of course, with AB 109 and Prop 47 now, um, Prop 47 went into effect the day after the election in November. That has changed some of the way that we do business, and it, it will result in those individuals that would be booked into jail um, being right back out on the street again. So we do anticipate an uptick in those part one crimes. Now on for some really good news. Calls for service. In 11-12, we had 36,000 calls for service in the city of Menifee. In 12-13, the fiscal years, we had 37,600 calls for service. Last year, we crested 41,000 calls for service. So you can see, those deputies that you see going to and from, uh, they are moving. They're actually out there taking care of business, doing it with less. So they're doing a very good job out there. I'm very proud of them. Response times. During the last few years, the city of Menifee has been improving infrastructure. As such, roadways have been constantly in a state of repair and will continue to be so probably for about the next three or four years. Historically, this would mean an increase in response times, especially priority one. In fiscal year 13-14, the City of Menifee Police Department arranged our deployment to assist in maintaining those response times. We are hoping to keep it constant. Response times for priority one calls increased by 30 seconds in 2012, then one minute and 30 seconds in 2013. In 2014, the City of Menifee Police Department was able to reduce response times to priority one calls by one whole minute. We've also been able to reduce 
all calls for service priority one, two, three, and four by a minute. I expected some clapping on that. <laughs> You guys are a pretty hard crowd. I, I was actually doing a little dance in my office when I was getting these numbers. Some challenges and opportunities. Uh, most of you have already heard me speak several times on AB 109, so I'm, I'm not going to go in depth into that, but realize that we were already dealing with that problem, and now we have Proposition 47. And that's basically changed mis uh, felonies to misdemeanors. Um, that is going to create an issue for us that we're already starting to see here in January. We want to continue directed enforcement efforts by utilizing the uh, crime control model. And what I mean by that is data is constantly being gathered within the City of Menifee Police Department to not only identify hotspots, but to be able to predict where certain crimes are going to occur in the very near future so that we can attack them that way as well. Uh, we get together constantly. I'm sure uh, Lieutenant Gein will tell you I'm a pain in his butt. Uh, we are always in communication to try and better that process. Um, and I do believe that that has had a big, big impact on those part one crime numbers. The other things we like to do, outreach programs, of course, the Neighborhood Watch. Uh, town hall meetings, but our, our most important asset uh, is our volunteers and the partnerships that we hold within the community. Without the help of our volunteers as our extra eyes, ears, and without the partnership of the community, it would be very difficult to do the job that we do. So I applaud all the businesses out there. I applaud all the people who want to volunteer. And if you want to get an application to volunteer, just see me. I've got plenty of them, and I'll help you fill it out. Uh, we, continue, we will continue to utilize all available resources that are at the Paris Station uh, to assist with any kind of Part 1 crimes or any kind of quality of life issues. Because we have such a big station, we have an army to pull from. We continue to focus on quality of life issues in the city of Menifee around commercial and residential areas, and we'll continue our partnership with city departments, contracted entities, and also our allied agencies. We'll continue to seek additional funding through grants. That could be the Office of That could be the Office of Traffic Safety or Off-Road Vehicles. Although we continue to be tenacious with seeking grant funding, I will be requesting additional uh, patrol and traffic officers for the years to come. The city has been and continues to be very dedicated to increasing police services as well as public safety as a whole. And for that, I am truly grateful. With that, uh, I'm going to close. And if you have any questions, I've, I've already informed the mayor they must be in written format. So. Please turn them, turn them in at the end. Thank you, sir. Captain, from a, from a street level view, from a tactical standpoint, um, what do you see, from your, from your perspective, what do you see as Menifee's top law enforcement challenges at, from a street level perspective? Again, AB 109 and Prop 47, the laws are always changing on us, and we have to come up with new and outside the box ideas um, to make sure we are curtailing crime by getting rid of the people that are committing maybe less crimes and being returned to our own um, community, but keeping an eye on them to where um, we continue to follow up with probation and we continue to capture those individuals time and time again until they take off to state prison. Uh, as far as um, a need that the uh, city of uh, Menifee Police Department needs is uh, manpower. The city, the city of Menifee is a very young city, and I've never seen such a young city so dedicated to the public safety. Um, they continue to add bodies year in and year out. Uh, so they are dedicated, they are tenacious to building that public safety. 
Um, and that, of course, is going to help with your response times, with calls for service, and also um, with crime itself, or one crime. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. And uh, there's no doubt that uh, this council will certainly give you and seek to give you those tools that you need. We're very appreciative. Um, our next speaker, our next speaker holds an MBA degree with an emphasis in health services management from the University of Dallas. He also has a BBA degree from the University of Texas, El Paso, and he also holds a CPA certification from the state of Arizona. With over 25 years of healthcare management experience, he's made a career out of turning uh, non-performing hospitals around and into solid performers and all the while improving healthcare uh, to patients in the process. A former CFO, COO, and CEO in both private and nonprofit organizations, please welcome to the podium Mr. Greg Padilla, the Chief Administrator, Menifee Valley Medical Center. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm glad to be here and be able to present all the good things that are going on and what we're looking at for the future at Menifee Valley Medical Center. And I want to start off one of the progress that we've done in the hospital over the last three or four years and what we're doing to improve quality of health care for everybody here in the Menifee. One, um, we are now a five-star hospital rated under health grades. And we got our five-star rating under the treatment of failure, uh, uh, respiratory failure, pacemaker procedures, treatment of stroke, hip fracture treatment, and total knee replacements. We also are a Gold Seal accredited Joint Commission Hospital, which is coming up again on our survey this year. And then there's also an organization called CalNOC, which is a national organization that actually monitors and ensures our nursing care and our nurses' standards are up to par. And we did get recognized for performance of excellence for catheter-associated um, urinary tract infections for critical care, central line-associated bloodstream infections for the total facility. So we're very proud of that, to bring that to Menifee and continue to improve the quality of healthcare. When we look at 2015, we look at our strategic initiatives and we look at what can we do to continue to build and bring the right services for the facility at uh, Menifee. Well, one, Menifee Valley Medical Center over the years has never had a medical office building. So we've got to correct that because we've got to continue to recruit doctors to the area. And so we're actually right now converting some space right now, what used to be called the Ed Center, into medical office space to bring some doctors, and we've got some doctors to lease that space. We also are looking at some administrative space to recruit them um, to actually um, convert it to medical office space and to, uh, as well to bring some doctors. New services, endoscopic ultrasound. It's a new service to the area. It's a new service to the Temecula Valley. It's, um, it actually, it's used for cancer treatment, and it's also for liver disease. It's a different procedure. Endoscopy it is a colonoscopy. Typically, it's exploratory. With endoscopic ultrasound, basically, you can do biopsies, and you can go in there and do a biopsy and, and, and see if, go deeper into the, into the cavity of the body and see if there's any problems with liver or cancer. We're actually going to build out the fourth floor this year. The fourth floor has been, um, over the years, the hospital was built and opened up in 1989, and the fourth floor was actually been in the shelf space. This year, we're actually going to, by the end of this, this, this year, we will have an acute rehab unit, an inpatient acute rehab unit with 23 beds. And that will actually bring in, that's another new service to the area, because we've been looking for what, what can be unique for us and to bring the Menifee and what is needed. And that would actually be services that will provide, um, get back to life, people get back to life in a normal lifestyle for patients that are stroke, spinal cord injury, amputations and hip fractures. ER, the emergency room, as you know, everywhere, and especially right now with the, uh, with the flu epidemic, you know that the flu, the ERs are over inundated. And they are constantly are, actually. ERs are, the increase in use of emergency rooms are really, have gone up in over the years. So this year, try to alleviate and try to, try to um, reduce the wait times for, the, for when you need to come to the emergency room, we will be starting a new program called ER Express. You will be able to go on the computer and actually look for when there's slow times and actually make an appointment to come to the hospital and you won't have to be caught in the waiting of all of the other patients. Um, orthopedics is our biggest surgical line. 
when you talk about surgery, we'll be look, uh, pursuing a uh, center of excellence in orthopedics. And then another area that's really uh, taken off a lot in, the, um, in California as well as in the United States is behavioral health. 5150 psych, psych um, patients and all that. And, and the state and every hospital really is having a difficult time for doing that, handling that. So we're going to be looking at initiative and see what we're going to do outpatient-wise and inpatient-wise to try to alleviate that for the area. Another area that really affects area is affordable health, the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known, or almost everybody, is the Obamacare. Well, let me give you an update on what's going on with Obamacare or the Affordable ACA. Well, here in um, California, in Riverside and San Bernardino, IEHP, which is the Inland Health Empire Plan, over the year, since it started, since inception, has enrolled one million new provide, um, patients or enrollees. One million. It's grown. The big thing now, do enrollees. Do enrollees are patients or um, the patients that actually have both Medicare and Medicap. That's, that's a big one because that would actually funnel people into whether they can go into um, IEHP or Molina and then they don't actually qualify for um, Cal covered California. But the big thing going on this year is the health exchange when the Obamacare, uh, the Affordable Care Act came out, the health exchange was uh, actually the, the medium that was going to be the, the, the control in every state or within the United States of how you did divide it and how you um, set up your, um, your, your health plans. Well, the health exchange has continued to develop in California, and we predict by February that one million is going to go up to 1.7 million participants. So it continues to grow. Federal subsidies is going to be a real big question this year, whether federal the company is going to be able to federally subsidize for the, the low income, the indigent, and so help subsidize the states to pay for that, for that health care. You're going to see insurance companies um, actually go away from individual policies. Then they're going to be more focused on small group policies, which is going to be small business policies, employees, um, business with 50 or less employees. What are the ACA, well, the Affordable Care Act challenges? Well, when it came out, a lot, I think there was a lot, of, um, a lot of misconceptions of what affordable care was actually rolling out. And one of the, one of the big concept, misconceptions was the high deductibles. A lot of, um, we had a million people ro enroll, but the high deductibles are so high uh, on the, um, the insurance plans that are offered there in that they either turn into bad debt or go unpaid. The other thing that Affordable Care Act did not catch is that the, um, did not catch the Medi-Cal, the doctors that are not participating in Medi-Cal. The Affordable Care Act really relies heavily on, people, on, on physicians who have to perform except Medi-Cal. You're going to see managed care, more managed care, bundle payments, more things, ACO, um, which is uh, hospitals and um, organizations that are going to bundle and bring together a system and contract a system total health care for, for, for the, the families and total health care for the patients. And then we're going to continue to see um, what we call pay for performance, which is under quality and service. And pay for performance is it's, it's just what the, um, the federal government has done is that the pay for performance funds are actually the existing funds, but they became, the, the, the plan is they will divvy up that money separately, differently, which is core measures, which is on outcomes and quality, the care that you provide to the patient. Then hospital acquired um, conditions, which is pressure also, pressure ulcers, um, MRSA, MRSA, and then patient safety. And then that's kind of, doctors and hospitals are going to have to perform well on that. And then of course, so for you that might know about HCAPS, HCAPS is how we monitor every quarter. The federal government monitors the service that we provide to the patients. And then we're going to continue to see an increase in our volumes, emergency room volumes. One thing that um, we didn't see, or the government didn't see with um, the Accountable Care Act, was the, the individuals that finally got onto health, got health insurance and were enrolled in health insurance typically use the ER, all, the ER for their services. Well, under an insurance plan, you, got, you can get a, a primary care provider, but that has taken a slow learning experience and you still see people coming to the emergency room. Going on, what's, what are the concerns today? Well, in the Supreme Court, 
um, the Supreme Court is going to be making a decision on what, how to handle subsidies, whether it's legal, can the, legal for the government to provide subsidies for indigent care, and then we're going to look at, can the, uh, is it um, constitutional for the, the federal government to, um, to require employee mandates, employers to provide health insurance. And then the last item that's going to be a big topic is the president's position on immigration. His position on immigration right now, it's predicted that 1.5 more um, individuals be eligible for health insurance in California. So, big challenge this year. The other area that very concerning and one thing everybody needs to know is the flu. The flu is bad this year. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a tough flu. If you look at the map, every state, almost every state up there has been, in, has been affected by the flu. There was a flu shot, but what happened with the flu shot this year is that one strand was not included in the flu shot that's, that, it's not, that came up this year, and it's the Texas flu. So the Texas flu was not in the strand, so what you're seeing right now is the strand of the Texas flu that's affecting a lot of people, and it's all over the United States, and it's very big this time. It's causing a lot of wall times in, in, the, in California with the ambulance and a lot of people coming to the emergency room. The big thing, what can you do for the flu? Well, get vaccinated, even though they don't have the, um, the flu strand for, um, for uh, Texas, it's still the best protection. And some people should, well, there's some people that should not get the flu vaccine. And you just gotta be aware of that. If you have allergies that can cause serious injury to yourself, Make sure that, um, talk to your doctor, make sure you don't have that. And then of course the risks of the react, there's always gonna be risk for the, the flu vaccine. So don't be alarmed. Sometimes it causes fatigue, sometimes it causes, uh, um, causes you to be weak, but those are short lived. But the flu vaccine is your best protection. And if you have a, a serious reaction, and if you have any questions, um, definitely um, 911 or you can always call our hospital and you can talk to our infectious um, disease department. Our director would be de definitely able to answer any questions and help you out, and that's what we're willing to do. And then if you want to learn more about the flu, the epidemic, and what's going on, and any questions about it, there's, uh, talk to your primary care doctor. You should be able to answer anything that you need. And then health department, and then of course the Centers of Dis Disease and Control. Those are the numbers, those are your main contacts, but always, you can always call the hospital. We have a department that deals just this with that. And then the last thing, your best prevention is wash your hands. Or it's flu. Just wash your hands. Thank you very much, everybody. Now, Greg, you had mentioned uh, uh, your business model at the hospital. And what, from your perspective, what can, what can you do from your perspective to help us drive our local economy and what can the city of Menifee do with you in partnership to uh, make that come alive? Well, typically at every, every um, um, community, your hospital is one of your anchors. We want to be that anchor for, to bring and drive new business to the, to the community. And um, what we can do, we're definitely going to continue to do is support the city in any which way we can, financially, tax-wise plus bring in the doctors and the services that we need. And we want to be very, very sensitive to what is needed to the, for the city. And we want to work with, you, with the city, Dr. Scott Mann, um, in what the city needs, if there's anything the city feels that they, they need as a service to come to Menifee that would help actually bring and attract um, industry, people to the community, we definitely want to talk to you and we want to be going and, and work with the city to provide that for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg, and uh, we still need to get that helicopter pad built for your hospital, don't we? Yeah. Uh, where's the uh, community development director? He's not here. Can you pass that message along, Jeff? <clears throat> um, thank you very much, Greg, again, and uh, well, well, well done to you, and thanks for everything that you're doing for the community. Uh, our next speaker I've known for a while, a good friend of uh, many of us in the room. Uh, he has over 38 years in public education, and during that time, he has been a classroom teacher, he's been an assistant principal, and he's been a principal. He received his bachelor's degree and teaching credential from UCLA, and his master's and doctorate de degrees were conferred upon him by the University of Laverne. He has served on the Central County United Way Board of Directors since 2000, and previously served on the Board of Directors of the Menifee Valley Chamber of Commerce. 
He currently serves on the board of the Menifee Valley Boys and Girls Club and is a member of Menifee Rotary International. He's very involved uh, in this community and it gives me, it gives this proud USC Trojan great pleasure to introduce a devout UCLA Bruin fan. Please welcome Dr. Jonathan Greenberg, our superintendent of the Paris Union High School District. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure. I thank the mayor, uh, honorable city council members, and those assembled here. Um, Menifee is a great city, and the school district is very proud to be a partner with almost everything that you do here. Um, uh, I know my uh, uh, comrades in arms, Dr. Steve Kennedy, the superintendent of Menifee Union School District, and Dr. Julie Vitale, the superintendent of Roma Land School District there, at a superintendent's conference today up in Monterey. So Monterey, Menifee, Monterey, Menifee. I chose Menifee. Obviously, the two of them are way smarter than me. They're up in Monterey. Um, but I, uh, obviously, some of the things I talk about really are K-12 issues facing the community. But what I'm going to tell you in a couple of minutes is a little bit about an exciting new high school coming to Menifee on the east side. And I'm hoping someday it'll be in the sphere of influence of the city and maybe a part of the city. But before I do that, I want to kind of dovetail a little bit uh, Captain Judge and uh, the Sheriff's Department are great partners of all three school districts. And uh, you probably all have read, it seems that 21 Jump Street just does not want to go away. Last year at Paloma Valley High School and at Paris High School, we had undercover uh, deputies there. Uh, the captain didn't even know about it. Um, the sheriff knew about it, uh, lieutenant in Riverside, and two of us in the school district. Our principals didn't even know about it. And uh, as you know, 25 students were arrested, uh, 12 from uh, Paloma Valley and 13 from Paris High School, and they all pled guilty. And most importantly, we're hoping that they've turned their lives around. And more important than that, we're hoping it made a small dent in the drug activity that goes on in high schools, which goes on in America. Um, I will tell you, we are the only school district in Riverside County who will participate or is participating in that program. Because some communities, in my opinion, don't, um, don't realize that if you can attack the problem at an early age, and we teach responsible decision making from kindergarten all the way through high school, and yet kids still sell drugs at school. And so doing a program like this, for some reason, it's controversial everywhere but in Menifee and Paris. And I'm proud to say that um, I'm, uh, when I get asked the question, uh, we currently have uh, undercover deputies at Heritage or at Paloma. The answer is I can't confirm or deny that. And uh, we're going to continue to do whatever we have to do to make our schools safe. My granddaughter is going to be attending Paloma Valley High School next year. And uh, she's a straight A student at Menifee Valley Middle School, having a great experience there. I don't think that she's going to buy or sell drugs. But I don't want her to have to go in the restroom at Paloma Valley High School and witness that nefarious activity. And I can tell you what, the kids have taken notice of it. Recently, we had uh, the dogs out. We bring the dogs out every once in a while, the drug-sniffing dogs out to our schools just to sniff around kids and around their backpacks and around cars. And we had it all clear at Heritage High School. All clear. The dogs didn't find one sniff. Now, I'm not foolish enough to believe that maybe there weren't some drugs hidden, but the good news is that again, maybe, just maybe, they're going to push that off. And let's hope, uh, Captain Judge, they're not doing it in the community as well. But I want to thank the community because I've received a lot of uh, angry emails from around the country, but not one of them from Menifee. And uh, I thank you for the support because, uh, again, it's not the only tool we use. It's certainly an effective tool. And I have to tell you, the two deputies that I met are heroes. They put their lives on the line. Because when you go undercover, uh, you get caught being an undercover deputy. Um, the penalty from the drug dealers is usually uh, one that puts you uh, into a permanent state known as death. And so I'm really proud of those deputies. And I, again, thank the community for supporting us. Something else I want to mention, I wasn't here last year, is to tell you that uh, our high school students at Paloma and at Heritage in Menifee are still the only students throughout the state, all of them, every single one, special ed kids all the way up to the kids going to college, each one has a Chromebook. 
it is a right, a responsibility for a school district to teach kids to use the kinds of things they're going to use in the military, the kinds of things they're going to use on the job, and the kinds of tools they're going to use going to college. So every single one of our kids has a Chromebook, and our teachers are teaching using it. So that means you can have a student submit an essay, I saw it today at Heritage High School, to his teacher, and the teacher was in the back of the classroom writing comments on the side of his paper that she was seeing virtually and sending it back to him. We have students turning in work at 2 and 3 in the morning, sorry to the parents that they're doing that, but it's being graded. So I'm really proud of the fact that the, um, we're, we're not only using the tools that are available to us, but instead of spending money on papers and pencils and textbooks, we're going to spend more money on technology and make sure our teachers are using it to improve instruction in the classroom. Um, really very proud of the fact that Heritage today is working on FAFSA. That's the forms that students fill out to get college aid, student aid. Our goal is to have 70% of the kids at Heritage filling out that form because those forms that they turn in can, can, can contribute to uh, lower education costs by giving them free money as well as low interest loans so they can go to whatever college or trade school that they're going to attend. And speaking of heritage, in, in about 3.30 today, we are going to unveil the new STEM building, Science, Te Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics building at Heritage. You'll be able to see 3D copiers, 3D uh, copiers that the kids are using. You'll get to see the robotics. Uh, kids today, and I know yours, there's a lot of controversy over these new tests that we're going to be giving this spring. I'm going to tell you, statewide, nationwide, the scores are going to go down. But the good news is they're going to come back up because what we're doing is instead of teaching kids to memorize things, we're making kids learn how to teach themselves to make things, to invent things, to write things, because that's where America's jobs are in the future. You know, we've done a great job in public education preparing kids for the 20th century. The last time I checked, it's 2015. And we really need to do a better job, and hopefully in the high school district, we think we're on the cutting edge of making sure that our students are not only graduating college, go, I mean graduating high school and going to college, but having the opportunity to go to the world of work and get a really good job, maybe even at the hospital or maybe even the sheriff's department. Now, you might recall a couple of years ago, at a historic vote, this community supported our bond measure, Measure T. Approximately $76 million of that bond is going to be spent here in Menifee, first and foremost, to build a new high school. The new high school is going to be on Scott Road, actually north of Scott Road, uh, about a half mile north, on, and the eastern border of the school would be Leon Road. And that's where a brand new comprehensive high school is going to be built. And normally I would tell you that high school is going to be ready to go in two years. Little problem. Governor Brown, who has done a really nice job improving and increasing our funding for regular education programs, doesn't have a state construction bond measure, meaning school districts have depended 50-50. We put up 50%, the state puts up 50%. Problem is, the state doesn't have their 50%. We believe there's going to be a bond measure in 2016. School districts and construction people, realtors throughout California are going to put a bond measure on to build and to modernize California schools. And the good news for Menifee, we're showing student growth. We're going to be at the top of that list to build that brand new high school. And for those of you who can see it, after you get past my name, that's what the high school is going to look at like. Now, I have to tell you, this design was done by Baker and Nowicki Architects. They're the ones that did Murrieta Mesa High School when you drive down the 15 just south of Cal Oaks Road. Take a look at that. This is going to be the nicest high school in California, certainly in Riverside County. And so if you are um, looking at it this way, this would be Leon and Scott would be over here. So this is the, what the new high school is going to look like. Let, let me give you some specifics about it. 268,619 square feet. We're going to have about 2,500 students, 92 teaching stations. We're going to have parking for 500 students. And Gene, if you can go back, I want to show them something. Um, the student parking is on the top of the screen, and the parent parking is over here. We realize that when parents come to school, 
they don't want to have to park in the student parking lot and find their way. So we're really trying to mitigate traffic issues by making sure there's multiple ways into the school. The gymnasium is here right towards the front of the school as is the administration and all of the classroom buildings are on this side. And by the way, there's a 23 foot drop from this end of the property to this end. So what we decided for the neighbors, so they don't have the lights in their homes, we're, we're putting the field, the football field over here on the down slope and the, uh, over here also the play fields are lower so that when it rains, the water goes down there. When we have lights and games, the homes that are predicted to be over in that area won't see the lights because the lights will be down lower and further away from the home. So we really tried to develop that part. Here's some conceptual drawings. Those aren't real cars. You might expect. That's the front of school right off of Leon. Now I hope you can see the modern technology that we're taking advantage of, covered hallways. Uh, when we built, when Paloma was built years and years ago, no shade. So we had to spend two and a half million dollars to put in a shade structure at Paloma. So uh, it's, I don't think the weather's gonna get any cooler and that we're gonna have more rain, but we're certainly gonna have a lot of sunshine. So we take advantage of a lot of areas on campus for that. So that's the area, that's kind of in the center of the campus. And then if you take a look, um, this is the gymnasium here, looking out on the football field. And you can see up here, there's some glass for those students who are working the weights and doing all kinds of exercises. They get to look out on the athletic field. And as you can see, you're looking up towards the campus, towards the classroom area of the school from the football area of football stadium and track stadium. Here's another look. This is, um, this is the library, I believe, on the left. We don't call it, but actually the student union building on the left and the theater on the right and administration. So this is looking north, just as you would come up from the football area. Next picture. Again, another representation of that same area. By the way, the class, uh, that's a classroom building over here. Lots of areas for collaboration. The new classrooms of the 21st century are not just classrooms with 36 desks and a teacher. Lots of rooms for students to do projects out in the middle area and for teachers and students to collaborate. There's also a professional center right out here. This is where the, we, would, we used to call the teacher's lounge or the teacher's area at workroom. It's right down there. Go ahead, Gina. And this is the uh, lunch area, quad instructional area you can see on campus. And that's the student union building. And above it is the library. Inside the library. <coughs> this is a, a collaboration room where students, and again, when, with the technology being wireless, they don't need to be hanging out in the classroom. They can take their technology with them and go to areas where they can collaborate and work together. Kind of looks like a modern workplace. This is that area I told you, the teacher's workroom area. And uh, if they like it or not, they get to look out on campus at lunchtime. Some of them will choose to look the other way. So um, what, what's my best guess on when we're going to be able to do this? We believe it's going to pass in either April or June of 2016. We believe we can start construction of the school in 2017 and hopefully open it in 2019. That would be our goal. Um, right now, just so you know, we're not sitting on it. These plans have to go to the state architect in Sacramento. They have to be approved. So we're going to finalize them this year so we can be in line. Because again, you won't get any money if you're not in line. And we want to get to the top of the list. Um, I would also tell you, Gina, if you can go back to the original picture. Let's see if, yeah, let's see if you're, Gina's so good. By the way, Gina is a UCLA person as well, so I appreciate your, uh, oh, I, Mayor didn't know that. Oh, sorry. Okay, this area that's blank, it's almost a rectangular area in the upper right-hand corner. We believe Valley Wide is going to put a park in there. And uh, always the question is, well, could you put a pool in there? Well, we could, but for those of you who have been waiting for a pool at Paloma Valley High School forever, um, the superintendent is not willing to commit to put in a pool there until we have plans maybe with the city on the other side of the viaduct there 
uh, over at Paloma Valley putting in a pool. But obviously, you know, we do have the pool up here, uh, the new uh, uh, between Paris and Menifee. And because of the competition between Paris and Menifee, notice that that facility is like right between Paris and Menifee. But we actually have a water polo team from Paloma Valley and from Heritage and swim teams at both schools. And we're transporting up, them up to that facility for its use. So um, not sure about a pool here, but uh, I'm told by the Paloma Valley people, if I put a pool up there, there's going to be war in Menifee, and I don't want that. I might have to call the captain for some protection. Anyway, I will be available um, uh, after for any questions you might have. Again, we appreciate your support of our public schools, K-12 in Menifee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. You know, I have a couple, couple questions. There's one way that we could fund um, school construction and roads and infrastructure construction, which would be for the governor to uh, kill the bullet train and redirect all that money into constructing our roads and our schools. We don't need another bond. But if that doesn't happen, then I guess we'll have to look at approving that bond in 2016 so that we can give our students the state-of-the-art facilities that they deserve. Um, Dr. Greenberg, just two questions for you. I'll ask them both, and then you can respond if you would, please. Um, with the construction, in, in our county, we seem to have a shortage of substitute teachers. And we also have, uh, we, we, we're pumping out credentialed teachers a little bit slower than we used to. Number, the, the first question is, how would you intend to staff that new campus would be the first question. And then what is your best estimate for uh, the creation of the Menifee Unified School District when we, when do you think the unification is going to occur? Well, I, I think the unification question is, uh, is Menifee Union is starting its own process looking at unification. But unification has been discussed all the way back into the 1980s. The high school district was created in 1890, uh, 1889, I believe. And Menifee was a small little hamlet, and they were fortunate that Paris had a high school and that they sent a bus down here to pick up kids. But clearly, men, if every, uh, the districts have, since I've been here, working with Dr. Calloway when she was superintendent, the districts have collaborated on unification. Unification isn't a question of if, it's a question of when. Right now, if Menifee were to unify July 1 of 2015, there would be 4,200 students at Paloma Valley High School. I was told it was horribly overcrowded at 3,200. 4,200 would mean triple session. And again, uh, I don't, uh, our district does not believe that's in the best interest of the Menifee students. So, uh, because as you know, Heritage is in the city of Menifee, but it's not in the Menifee School District. It's in the Romaland School District. So in unification, Heritage stays in the Paris Union High School District. So uh, because Menifee is growing, and there's no question, the education in Menifee is superior. Menifee could easily run two high schools, and what we're hoping is with the completion of that new high school, you'd have Paloma on the west, you'd have the new high school on the east, that way you don't have people crossing over the 215 at the Holland Road, oh, that hasn't been built yet, the Holland, over the, still, still waiting for that on there, um, that uh, you would have a high school, a comprehensive high school on each side of the freeway, and clearly we think that would be the best time, but clear. Unification is an issue for the Menifee Union School District, uh, but we're, we've been collaborating with them since the beginning. And what we're, it, throughout the state, you see this where high school districts fight the elementary district over unification. We believe that's a waste of taxpayer money. Menifee's certainly large enough and way smart enough to be able to run a K-12 district on their own. So our job would be to make that happen. With, and we believe, again, the timing would be perfect with the completion of that new high school. And um, staffing of the new high school. Staffing of the new high school. We have no problems. I can't answer, talk to the, about the Roma Land or Menifee Union uh, situation, but high school district, we've been having 50, 60 candidates for jobs, even while the teaching credential population is going down. Special education is a little difficult. Sometimes American Sign Language or certain uh, classes that we teach are difficult to find qualified candidates. But Frankly, we haven't had a problem, and I, I think it's your community. I think when you come, to, when you graduate uh, from Cal State San Bernardino or Cal State LA, San Diego State, USC or UCLA, you don't want to live there and work here. You want to live here. 
So I commend everybody in this room for making Menifee such an attractive place to live because our new teacher candidates, the good news, many of them are moving here and living here. And we think that's always going to be an attractive incentive because it's certainly less expensive to live here. Um, the air is clean. The people are friendly. And uh, we think that's a great attraction. And we think the smartest teaching candidates look at the whole package. And if they don't look at the whole package, they probably should teach in San Gabriel and not teach in Menifee. So, thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Dr. Greenberg. Appreciate those responses. Um, our final speaker for this, this afternoon uh, holds a bachelor's degree in business from SDSU, a Juris Doctorate degree from the Thomas Jefferson School of Law. He has over 13 years of economic development experience with 10 of those years working for the City of Vista, managing multi-million dollar uh, developments of all types. Here in the City of Menifee, he is focused on business attraction, business retention, and marketing by developing um, and creating the city's first economic development plan, the restaurant incentive plan, and the city's comprehensive business incentive plan. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jeff Wyman, our economic development director for the city of Manatee. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, as you can tell, there's a lot of great things going on in the city. And uh, I'm briefly going to cover some of the great things that are going on in an economic development uh, portion of the city. Uh, so to start with, I'm just going to uh, bri briefly cover some of the um, background facts uh, within the city of Menifee. Uh, we were incorporated in 2008. We have approximately 46 square miles. And currently, we're at 84,000 plus residents. We are the second fastest growing city in Riverside County, and currently our average age is around 37. The uh, median household income is uh, above 67,000. And one of the best features of the city of Menifee is its location. We are center stage. We are in the center of southwest Riverside County. And what that gives us is better ac access to the population in the southwest Riverside area. Our trade area of 15 uh, miles includes over 740,000 people, or almost a third of the population of Riverside County. That gives us uh, the ability to be a prime destination for commercial and residential um, development. Currently under construction in the city, uh, in the residential aspect, we have over 25 projects going on in the city. We are growing rapidly. We have 28 more in final map approval. And the new home prices are above 322,000. Uh, I know it's above that. This is a 2013 number from WR Cog. Uh, I'm sure they're above that now. Um, we have over 31,000 households. Uh, we'll have over 31,000 by 2016 and going uh, even further. Beyond that, uh, we did a study and there's 11,000 more units that are either under construction now or have the ability to be under construction in a final map process. Past that, we have another 19,000 units that are on the way that are in the processing uh, format. These will all be single family houses and quality master plan communities. Uh, this population growth continues to fuel new retail and commercial development. Uh, as you know, we have uh, our largest uh, commercial and retail development is the Countryside Marketplace. It is wildly successful, uh, but we need more. Uh, the, uh, with over 84,000 people, uh, we need more amenities of retail, restaurants, and we have multiple centers that are moving, moving forward. Uh, I've been working there for three and a half years and I'm proud to say that we have a lot of new developments that are coming in. Uh, some of those new developments are a Town Center Marketplace, which is on the uh, intersection of Newport and Hahn, which is a 12-acre, uh, 89,000 square foot retail development, which includes Aldi's, PetSmart, Party City, Kirkland's, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, the Habit Grill, and others. That hopefully will be grading soon and development here in 2015 starting. Just a little bit west of that, we have a, a Kokorian Theater that will be moving forward. You may have seen the sign off of Newport. 
uh, theater was one of the most asked for items from our residents in pretty much every event that we have. So we're very happy to have that moving forward, but we're even more happy that it's really not just a theater, it's an actual entertainment complex. It has, uh, it's scheduled to have 14 screens, 16 lanes of bowling, and a sports bar uh, and grill. So it'll be its own entertainment complex. So we're really looking forward to that moving forward. Um, additional centers, uh, shops at the lakes, which is on the east side of uh, the 215, which is a Stater Brothers Blue Ribbon development, which will include CVS. Uh, at the intersection of Newport and Antelope, we have the Menifee Lakes Plaza, which is moving forward, hopefully under grading here soon, which will include uh, LA Fitness, and also other retail and restaurants. Um, as you've all been aware, Walmart has been looking at moving forward with a, a center on the intersection of Scott and Han Road. They are moving forward with that. They're currently finishing up construction documents. Hopefully they'll be under construction in 2015 as well. Right across the street from that is an approved project which is called the Junction. It's a 528,000 square foot power center. They're out uh, seeking tenants as, as we uh, talk here today. Uh, in addition to that, a little bit south of Scott Road, we're very happy to have the city's first uh, light business park and light industrial park move forward. Commerce Point 1 and 2 is an 850,000 square foot um, in light industrial park that you may have seen the grading if you go uh, up and down 215 south of Scott Road. They're currently grading right now. So we're very happy to have that moving forward. I'm hoping that you've uh, been able to enjoy some of the recent openings that have happened in the, in the city in the past year. Recently we had Applebee's, Five Guys, Jersey Mike's, Flame Broiler open. Uh, in the Countryside Marketplace, Ultra Beauty and Justice is opened. So we've had a lot of different activity going on in the city. All this points to opportunities for businesses in the future. Currently, right now, the city has a retail leakage of over $400 million. Now, what that is, is that the Menifee residents are spending over $400 million outside of our city. So our goal is to bring in the amenities, the retail, and the restaurants to allow some of that to recapture some of that leakage. Because the important part of that is, is that a lot of that creates sales tax. And the sales tax, the, poor, the city gets a small portion of that sales tax. What that does is it allows us to provide um, better essential services to the city, including more sheriff, more fire, and more infrastructure improvements. Of course, to support all of the development that's going on, residential and the commercial, the city understands that we have some circulation items to uh, address. And from that, the city council was very proactive and they passed uh, last year, I believe it was, the first capital improvement program for the city. It's an aggressive $100 million program to address some of the major circulation issues that we have in the city. Um, and a couple of them have already been completed. Last year, we completed the Newport Road widening. We completed the Menifee Road missing link. And currently under construction right now through utility construction and about to go into full-blown construction is the Newport, Ride, Newport Road interchange project. Beyond that, we also have the Scott Road interchange, the Holland Road overpass, the Bradley Road improvements, and also the McCall interchange. All this leads to a quality of life cycle that the city understands happens. What happens is that more businesses come into the city. This helps support property values. This helps support the schools, which brings in more visitors which increases the city revenue for essential services, the fire, the police, the infrastructure, and the residents get to enjoy these new benefits and the amenities and a higher quality of life. This in turn attracts more businesses and the cycle continues to grow. Looking ahead, with all the population growth that we have, the commercial developments, all the road and community improvements, the access to markets and suppliers and customers that the city has in the center of Southwest Riverside. This leads to an approved quality of life for Menifee residents. Menifee really does have more and Menifee is definitely open for business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff.
uh, for updating us on uh, what's going on. I know some, some of that information is, some of you have seen it before, but we have other things coming along. And uh, I just, I'd like, to, I have two questions for you, Jeff. Yes, um, we are in desperate need of a hotel or three in this city. Yes. And uh, frankly, I don't care whether they're three stories or ten, to be honest with you. But we need a, we need a facility that has the ability to have a convention center, a room where we can have uh, three or four or 500 people with other banquet rooms so that we don't compete with the, uh, the ladies league that comes off the tee here at lunch and eats lunch and, and listens to us talk. Um, when can we expect a hotel or two? And uh, um, what, that's the first question. Second question is, what other tools can we give you to put in your toolbox to help bring and stimulate economic development. What has the council not given you? Well, first on the hotel, um, we have been talking, the city has been talking with multiple hotel developers over the last year. I've been in multiple meetings with at least four or five different developers. It, it's uh, something that we have been trying to attract and we've been getting some great interest uh, within the development community. In fact, I just had a meeting this past week with a hotel developer. So it's coming, uh, we're working to attract it, we're working to include in it uh, some type of meeting convention center uh, ability because it's something that's definitely needed within the city. So hopefully within the next uh, you know, short time period, we'll be able to uh, find a deal that will actually work and move forward, um, at least for one. And whether it's three or four stories, I'm not sure either, but we have a definite need that we're going after. Um, as far as what the city can do to help, uh, we've already, the city council has been wonderful in, in helping with uh, economic development incentives. We have our business incentive program, which the council passed last year. It, it's a great tool for me. Uh, moving forward, uh, I think there's going to be some definite uh, op opportunities for economic development. Uh, the state just passed an, an enhanced uh, infrastructure financing district legislation. So we'll certainly be looking at that. But most importantly, what we really need is, uh, and the council's already been great, continued support from not only council, but from the residents. We want to hear what you need. Uh, what you need is what I'm going after. So that's, that's a great help. Thank you, Jeff, very much for that. And uh, I would agree that uh, Menifee's definitely on the move, continues to move, and Menifee's definitely open for business. And when you take a look at our panel of guest speakers today, uh, it truly is. You got safe, safe schools, safe neighborhoods, and safe businesses. You have quality health care system delivery. You have uh, quality public education with state of the art facilities. And you got a creative and flexible and nimble uh, economic development team at City Hall. All of that uh, spells success for the city. There's so much opportunity for businesses in here uh, and the ones that are not in the room. And all we need to do is keep getting the word out. And we ask for your help on that. And so how about another final round of applause for our guest speakers? Thank you all very much.